so there are a few faces that uh, i feel uh, i mean duty bound to introduce Please first uh, let yeah. me introduce the uh, honorable professor nawab ali khan the chairman of the department of commerce he is with us now and uh, oh. franco uh, uh, gandolf uh, is from us basically he had been to malaysia and he wanted to be with the panel so i said most welcome uh, we are academicians so any any new wisdom is a welcome uh, so we welcome franco and i also Thank welcome you. all the participants the panelist and um, uh, since we are already late shall we start the discussion so yes please may yes. i formally may i formally request the honorable uh, chairman of the department of commerce to please uh, welcome the participants briefly so that we can start uh, the program very fast please thank you sir nawab sahab your your microphone is off please switch on your microphone thank uh, you respected guests i welcome you all to this uh, event today uh, this is uh, one of the series that we are organizing the department of commerce without wasting a single moment i will request you to start your deliberations and we will uh, be joining you i welcome to all the guests also attendees ali bhai you are there i think you are, you 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 can initiate the process today uh okay senior of all assalam alaikum prof alaikum assalam rahmatullah barakatuh thank you uh, uh professor dr imran salim uh, dean of the faculty of commerce and uh, professor khan uh, professor farida hasan professor suhaimi and my friend uh, franco i think uh, this is a great opportunity to meet all of you and this uh, small world the digital divided the world into different have and have not but today looks like it is inevitable everybody has to be here uh, i think all of you perhaps familiar with me except uh, mr franco uh, i am professor khalik formerly from malaysia and i was the dean faculty of uh, economics and management science institute etc etc and retiring now i am here in the king kingdom so we are we are for uh, for a short while and i don't know how long we are all locked down due to the blessings of the covid so we have to unlock ourselves through the digital devices dr swami is my student and also colleague he is associate professor uh from the faculty of uh, economics and management sciences in iaum his phd from australia professor dr farida hasan uh the rose among the thorns today thorns said the professor farida welcome she is my colleague being the partner in the chart and shooter marketing she is a former dean in the institute of university technology she is a graduate from united kingdom she has a lot of experience almost uh, same like and then we have uh, here uh, may i request uh, gandhi to introduce yourself because you are new to me okay let me just sorry i had to unmute quickly so uh, yeah um it's a distinct pleasure to be here and uh, thank you so much for inviting me and uh, it's uh, it's an honor and i feel humbled uh, to be among uh, such esteemed colleagues uh, as yourselves so it's it's a pleasure to be here my name is franco gandolfi born and raised in switzerland but i spend a lot of my time in different parts of the world including australia united states the uae uh, fiji and malaysia also most recently and uh, currently i'm based in uh, vietnam but i'm doing most of my work uh, for georgetown university on the east coast of the us are uh, specializing in change management and leadership development thank you uh, you are welcome so back to the organizer professor imran salim saab and professor nawab ali khan as a host otherwise we can go quickly because the time is always very short please go ahead sir let us start the discussion because i mean see uh, the the whole let, uh, may I take a liberty to introduce the program itself for a minute okay actually uh, this is a 
Thank you very much, Prof. Imran Salim. This is a great opportunity, even though in, Mal in Saudi it's quite early now uh, compared to Vietnam and Malaysia. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, in the month of Ramadan, we always wake up. Actually, the topic for today discussion is a nation national response uh, to COVID-19. And Malaysia, of course, is one of the emerging rather emerge, I would say, last time, being the 17th uh, in the list on the top of the trading nations. But as we know, the world economies are suffering and uh, everybody is uh, caught into the of God. We don't know what and where. So today we would be more talking about the national response uh, related to this COVID-19 and Malaysia would be case study. So Dr. Swami, would you mind to take uh, my program? My plan is that we would just go for five minutes each and then second round. And then there may be some question answer session. So Dr. Swami, would you like to take five minutes to please share your experience? Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Khalid, uh, Professor Imran, Professor Khan, and other panelists, Professor uh, Farida, uh, Franco, and all. Thank you very much for this opportunity uh, to share our perspective, uh, being uh, a young uh, academic a student of uh, Professor Khalid and also later colleague. And based on my uh, academic uh, teaching of business ethics and strategic management, so uh, we can say the Malaysian uh, response <coughs> uh, to COVID-19 uh, early on uh, before March uh, from uh, November, December, because Malaysia is a, is a, is a hub okay, for trading, for tourism and so forth. So Malaysia is very open for people to come and transit and so forth. And uh, we we don't see, okay, our, our government didn't see this as a something emergency uh, until, uh, until March. Uh, we see the cases are increasing and the government has to take uh, strategic actions uh, to address this emergency. Uh, the, there are four main uh, strategic actions that um, they are taken by Malaysian government. So we can say uh, the, 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 the four actions can be divided into two actions for the government and the two actions for the public. Uh, the two actions for the government is first to close the borders. Uh, that's the more important thing to close the border. No one can come into Malaysia anymore, anywhere, by air, by land, or by sea, close. And number two, the government imposed the internal, internal lockdown. So we call here movement control order, okay? Uh, no one can go out uh, except those in the essential services. So those are the four actions taken uh, by the government. And another two actions is for the public to respond. So number one is the public, the social distancing. Uh, mm -hmm. the, they have to uh, distance uh, at least one meter in any situation if they go out. Okay? But the rest must stay at home. And number two, they have to keep, okay, when they go out, they have to keep the hygiene. Okay? They have to wash hands with soap and all hand hand sanitizer. So since those who outside okay, for work, etc., they are exposed. Uh, they are very vulnerable to the virus, so they are very careful. But those at home also need to be careful when they go out to purchase their grocery or they uh, receive deliveries. So they also have to practice the same, okay, the, the same uh, hygiene. So it became um, something very, very weird at the beginning. But Alhamdulillah, the government is not leaving the public, you know, quiet. The two things that I can see, communication and coordination. The government keep uh, telling people, stay at home, stay at home. Uh, even from the king, okay, our supreme king, keep addressing the royal address to you know, every day that you have to stay at home. And then the prime minister speech also to stay at home. And everybody, and even we have campaign hashtag uh, stay at home. So this becoming uh, the, the awareness becoming very high, and uh, suddenly you know it became 
it became you know part of their life you know uh, some people make joke of the you know this this uh, action but and of course uh, people cannot believe that they finally you know all this while they never stay at home uh, at least like like myself also i spend uh, only 2 3 hours at home uh, even though my house and the university is just 3 km but i spend most of the time in the university Isn't um, it good for you, Dr. Suhaimi? For isn't it good for you to be in prison like this and enjoy time with the family because you never have been caught being inside the four within the four walls of the house? Yeah. Isn't it, isn't it opportunity? <laughs> yeah, the opportunity that you know the socialization can, can, house. Okay, can we go actually? Thank you very much, Suhaimi. Yeah, Maybe no is opportunity for Prof. Farida Hassan being an academician and really dealing with the institutions of higher learning. What have been the impact to the Malaysian scenario in terms of, uh, because Malaysia is one of the attractions for educational pursuit by different parts of the world. Uh, is there any impact, perhaps uh, good or bad or whatever in terms of the uh, COVID-19 on Malaysian institutions? Prof. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, um, Prof. Uh, Khalid. Uh, but before that, I'd like to thank the organizer for having me here. And uh, let's just save the time. Maybe I thank them again later. But uh, in response to your uh, pointers, I would say definitely this uh, educational sector, especially universities, are highly affected by this uh, COVID-19. Because like what uh, Prof. Suhaimi mentioned just now, it's really an unprecedented economy, really, really unexpected. So, uh, you know, this kind of thing, although it has happened before, like the Spanish flu or the plague, uh, that was, uh, you know, a century ago. But uh, what I could see is that this will not stop or will not recover within weeks or months. It may take, seriously speaking, maybe a year or more than a year because to make it you know uh, back to normal uh, is actually very risky at the moment for people to go out uh, even though there are some assurance on the uh, movement control order and uh, but i think people are not willing the public are not willing to take the risk now coming back to the education sector interestingly public and private university reacts differently um, for your information uh, prof Khalid, since you are out of the country Uh, ever since COVID, the private sector had a big blow. It's a big hit because um, they are doomed for, I would say, suicide. You know, uh, because the the condition is that there's no classes, no fees, no incoming students, no registration of international students. So where would the revenue come in to support the private university? Whereas the public university, they are on a better platform because they have all the support system structure the governance there to to be able to continue their, their the way they do things but okay what i wanted to highlight over here is that um with this sudden stop um of the education system uh, due to covid that there, there should be a change that i would like to suggest over here from the traditional mode of teaching research and training that forces to look at things differently now um, and time is money because you know the longer you wait there will be no uh, revenue or no in fact graduation of students so that that's a, a dilemma for, for both parties yeah the stakeholders and the providers so uh, programs should also be looked into because Currently, or in the past, prior to COVID, we are focusing on full-time uh, students who are graduating uh, for the full-time employment. But what we should be looking now would be look um, to seriously think about gig economy, having gig programs in the universities to offer programs that are more uh, pressing, more informal, and yet very rewarding because uh, I think the full-time employment will just be over. There are many people who's going to stop working, they'll be out of jobs. So they have to think on something creative, what's next? So the universities okay. must prepare, yeah, must prepare Th towards that. 
okay uh, thank you prof rida for your inputs be an academics i think uh, uh, mr franco the vietnam is a stone throw throw away from malaysia is not that far we are sharing the same atmosphere you are part of the, but emerging recently the vietnam vietnam economy as a one of the tigers in the southeast asian nation uh, i mean region and uh, the very fast catching the gdp of the vietnam and looks like going very fast so perhaps you would be able to share with the, the audience here maybe your experience for 5 minutes perhaps absolutely and uh, thank you for mentioning that and uh, i do indeed have been watching uh, this very closely and i've been also comparing the various countries not only in southeast asia but on a global basis what do the europeans do what do the north americans do and what have the uh, southeast asian countries done interestingly i mean assuming that the virus started in china we started hearing about a lot of these aspects regarding the uh, the virus in the second part of uh, january so what actually happened in vietnam was um the the news inflow about the virus coincided with chinese new year which is also called the lunar new year here or the tet holiday in vietnam so at the beginning of february when people were supposed to resume work and that uh, the kids returned to school that never occurred and it still has not occurred since to uh, until today so vietnam very aggressively and also very quickly adapted to this new environment the news coming from china and vietnam very resolutely started certain aspects including physical distancing shutting down non essential businesses uh, forbidding large gatherings and also closing down schools not so much universities universities were still free to decide themselves whether they wanted to shut down but kindergarten and k to 12 basically shut down immediately it was also interesting to watch how certain political developments and i'm talking globally now how certain a global so political developments um led the president or led a cause and effect to certain actions so in the us for instance donald trump had just returned from a trip to india and it was only after he returned that he started taking action and something similar i observed in uh, in malaysia where malaysia had a lot of time to to consider this virus and the impact on uh, on the government and the people and the economy but as all of you know even better than i do malaysia was in a state of flux in terms of transition of power from the old government to the new government and perhaps a lot of the attention was kind of diverted from dealing with the virus to dealing with the transition of power and establishing a new government in malaysia okay uh, mr frank uh, frank you so sorry for interruption but uh, bear in mind one thing that malaysian economy always is known to look east so what affects the malaysian economy is basically what happens in japan what happens in korea what happens in china of course uh, malaysia traditionally have been the partner with the trading nations like united states european union etc etc but asean being one of the emerging region for the trade and development so perhaps your point bringing back to us and then that perhaps i i don't know but uh, maybe that would not have much effects and uh, i think malaysia was caught by surprise no doubt so was the united states even in worse situation maybe because of the uh, population aging population etc etc so uh, maybe it uh, maybe one more minute you can respond to that before i go about for second round please sure thank you and uh, i i consider going back to vietnam now i consider vietnam alongside singapore and alongside south korea as an early mover they quickly adapted to a new environment and started putting in certain measures including as i said certain distancing certain lockdowns on a more local level based on what they had heard out of china i think malaysia now bringing into your local context malaysia looked more at the numbers and the numbers of infected people and deaths and so forth 
looked very promising at, in the early stages in Singapore. They looked very um, promising uh, in, um, in Vietnam as well. So Malaysia really only put in this MCO once the numbers and perhaps it was a second wave. The first wave, Malaysia weathered well, and perhaps in a more second wave, then Malaysia reacted. And once Malaysia reacted, as all of I you know very well, they reacted I, very aggressively. And I, put in I, think, I, I agree with you because uh, we have to see from today that Malaysia is losing, I mean, going to relax because the problem is uh, if you don't die of the COVID, you will die of the I mean, uh, what call in Malay, laporan. I mean, you will be having with the, any penny left for buying your food and necessities. So there's yes. a big challenge for the government to look into it, basically. Okay, by the way, I look at more from positive side of it, the whole decision, not only Malaysia, even for the whole world, I would say. Uh, if you look the impact of this COVID on the environmental issues, oh my God, I found that is blessing in disguise. The 25 kilometers up there, the ozone layer, if you look at it, what is happening to that? The North Pole actually was melting because of the ozone layer due to the energy sector was, I mean, really big issue. And they have been talking about this uh, protocol and here and there. And the big brothers, they're the one who pollute the most. They're the one who make early out of it. So the ozone lore has a breathing period for it. The three kilometer from 25 to 28 kilometer up there in the sky is free to have the good breathing period for it. Because if you look at it, all the trains, all the buses, all the trucks, all the vehicles, and even aeroplane, which is very closer to the ozone layer, it has been emitting the emissions and thinning the and I was not surprised one day the sun rays will burn the whole world. And this has happened because you are forced to be at home and now you are not polluting the environment. This is good for the rest of the mankind, mankind as well as other creatures. And then you cannot stop the world at one go. You can lock down one country, the other country will pollute. You can lock down the China, but US will pollute. You will lock down the US, Europe will pollute. So in that case, I guess this is an opportunity for all of us. And maybe Prof. Imran Salim want to have a couple of minutes before we go for second round. Yes, Prof. I, we can't hear you, Prof. Prof. Imran Salim, we see your, your microphone. Okay, seems okay. Yeah, yes. go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Actually, uh, actually, what I was uh, contemplating that uh, the response of all the nations are almost identical, changing in the with the with the passage of time only uh, of implementation. Then, second thing is you rightly said that environment is a is a major gain of this. I mean, blessing in disguise. It's a perfectly all right. But what I really am concerned about that post COVID, once it is there. See, the, the nations uh, across the world have actually closed down their borders. And now it is almost a recessionary situation across the world. I don't think that world has ever before experienced halting of industries. Absolutely. There is an absolute halt of tourism. There is an absolute halt of aviation industry. So many industries are just blocked, zero. And when they start reviving, how what would be the national response and what is what is the likelihood and especially the island countries like malaysia and and, and uh, what about the food food sufficiency and food supply the, these are the two issues which i would request the panelists that if they can address and deliberate on this please thank you thank you very much i think prof ibran salim you have brought out that was my second round so this is this is basically thank you very much actually the idea is that when this kind of thing happens there is a new sh emerging world That's and what right. one of the direction of which i could see and panelist uh, dr swami prof farida mr franco you can deliberate on that uh, there would be certainly a death warrant for certain industries for example manufacturing tourism banking even for that matter they all would be actually in a big trouble and big fix 
they would not be able to contribute to the GDP of the nation. Like Malaysia, tourism was one of them. In, in fact, this is going to be a big issue. But at the same time, this is a blessing in disguise because there would be a, someone's loss is someone's gain. The industry which will be emerging again would be the agriculture industry. People are forced to go back from big cities to home and cultivate, tilt their lands. So agriculture industry would be coming up forward and it's very good for food security. <coughs> Secondly, there would be industry coming forward is the health and medical industry because everybody is concerned for health. So medical industry would be getting a lot of allocation national level. That will be a IT naturally. The world has been actually controlled now. The future would be AI, artificial intelligence. The artificial intelligence industry is going to emerge. And for your sake, let me share with you very frankly, you may disagree with me. For a artificial intelligence industry, which is controlling the all manufacturing, is coming forward very strongly. And bear in mind that for artificial intelligence industry, you need the rare earth. And 95% of the rare earth has the raw material coming from China alone. So China is going to dictate mm -hmm. the terms. So be, be mindful of these future implications. Maybe Dr. Sohemi, another couple of minutes for you. Yeah, thank you, yeah, Prof. Uh, we, uh, the Ministry of Higher Education already uh, opened up grant for us. So uh, me together with the IT friends, we already uh, applied a grant to make use of IT in our domestic uh, economy. So uh, Malaysia used to be agriculture economy uh, centuries ago. So we have to come back to our, uh, our self-sufficient economy. So currently our food security, um, we only have uh, for rice, just sufficient for 70% uh, of our consumption. So the rest we have to import from uh, Thailand, you know, uh, Laos, Vietnam, etc. The, the rice. So now, you can imagine we consume 80 kilogram rice um, per person, 80 kilogram rice a year by, by 32 million population in Malaysia. So, so we need to grow other things. Uh, for example, uh, uh, we need to grow fruits uh, and, and also talking about the herbal. Uh, actually, uh, all these traditional herbs, uh, traditional medicine already in our, um, our economy, but not uh, paid attention and not given any grant, etc. Okay, okay. okay. Yeah. Let me, uh, just uh, let me interject here. Uh, I think, Prof. Farida, you are the right person here to come in. I know. <laughs> you, you and me, both of us, we belong to Kedah, and the Kedah is a paddy field. Yeah, my, yeah, my, yeah. My village, your village. <laughs> and rice the, bowl, rice bowl. Rice bowl for Malaysia. The Kedah, I basically, my forefathers, they came from Pulai, and Pulai is known to be a paddy field. Yeah, it is yeah. an opportunity for the people in Kedah to grab this opportunity to go back to... So please share. Prof. Farida is basically from northern part of the Malaysia, which is Kedah. Me too, from Pera. <laughs> I have, I have bendang padi sawah. No, no, sorry, sorry. You, you don't qualify to be Kedahan. So, sorry, Shoaibi, I have to reject your, your joining the club. Prof. Farida, perhaps you can share how the Kedah can emerge as one of the leading uh, states okay. in, the, in uh, Malaysia. All right. Before I proceed, I, I, would, I would like to beg to defer on what uh, Mr. Franco mentioned just now regarding the Malaysian status. And I think Suhaimi would agree with me, I since Dr. Prof. Khalid is far away from homeland. Um, actually, Malaysia is doing pretty well with the MCO thing right now. We, in fact, recorded almost zero uh, death uh, last few days until you know some hiccups from the incoming uh, students uh, coming back and all that. Uh, I think probably Franco was reading too much on the medias, but the ones that are really uh, very challenging uh, countries like Singapore, America, and EU. So I think... Uh, Prof, you got off. You did uh, go straight to the point of the... Uh, the food food safe, safety and security no i'm not i'm coming yeah. back now i'm coming back to your point yes uh, you are talking about the uh, food security kedah itself also suffered uh, from because a lot of development prior to covid 
has really affected the food security or food uh, production. But I would like to suggest three things over here on what the university should look into that uh, you know that they should focus um, uh, after uh, during this COVID time and after post COVID. Uh, number one is to teach the basic skills to work independently because uh, with social distancing, the 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 the, uh, the population should look seriously what's the priority in in uh, in the economy. So agriculture is a big must. Number two, they need to expand career services to offer, as I mentioned earlier, gig careers. Gig careers would mean probably for a periodic time, uh, such as agriculture, marketing, logistics, food, healthcare, daycare, like you mentioned. And okay. university can also set up a quick job board, you know, like a career and counseling board. Maybe, maybe prof, I, I, prof, if I can interject here, sure. is it a good opportunity for the, for example, the women sector is very known to be multi-skilling compared to male counterparts. So they would be easy to adapt perhaps to the new changes because of being multi-skilling rather than <laughs> I can see you are nodding your head. Uh, quickly, maybe otherwise I go to Franco. Anything, uh, Prof. Aridal? Okay, uh, just one shot, one shot point. I disagree with that because those who will be badly affected with this COVID will be the male employers, employees, sorry. So yes. equally important would be the ladies, but ladies, they can stay home and do a lot of multitasking and, you know, like IOT, Internet of Things business, small businesses, so they can start from that. But we have to worry, you know, on the so-called breadwinners, and where are they going to focus their jobs in? If they can't produce, at least do marketing, because I do agree that we have distribution problem right now in the country. So the stocks are there, but the, the distribution is not there. Okay, okay, so okay, Prof. Pro, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Prof. Uh, Mr. Franco, another chance for you, a couple of minutes before we go to the organizers, maybe to have some questions answered from the participants somewhere. Yes, please, Franco. So I think, uh, well, thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Khalid. And uh, I think it's very important to also note um, among this panel that as with any situation or with any change, there are winners and losers. And uh, I think it's been, it's been spelled out already that some of the um, industries that have heavily suffered in the wake of, uh, of this crisis are things like you know, tourism, hospitality, food and beverage, um, transportation, airlines, and so forth. They have suffered very greatly and they will continue to struggle. But of course, as, with, as I said, as with any change, there will be winners. And, uh, and we have seen that already materialize. And uh, some of the winners will be looking at, uh, from, a, from a Vietnamese point of view, agriculture, uh, food, but also the de-urbanization, uh, people moving back into the country, leaving the big towns, the big cities, medical and health has already been uh, mentioned. But then also in terms of, and that's been mentioned too, you know, um, the uh, industry of 4.0, the thrift or the, the push towards more technology and e-commerce and digitization, artificial intelligence, robotics and so forth. I believe from my point of view, and again, looking from Vietnam, I think the country has been pushed forward by at least 20 years in a matter of two months. It's incredible the kind of development that we have seen um, in Vietnam also in the last uh, two months. Going back very quickly to what you were saying about food and food safety, of course there are certain countries, including uh, Malaysia, including Vietnam, where there is a lot of subsistent living, where people can live off the crops that they, that they produce. I'm thinking in terms of fishing, I'm thinking in terms of farming, um, but also um, part of the economy, which we often neglect, and I just watched a documentary this morning, the whole informal economy, all these people that have been hired and contributed to the economy that are not even counted officially, they have also suffered greatly. Okay, okay. okay, thank you, Franco, for a very good point bringing from Vietnam. Your neighbor, Cambodia, might gain better because they have a lot of agricultural land to be cultivated. Yes. And, uh, of course, uh, Vietnam always bully the neighbor, Cambodia, I know for sure. So, <laughs> but <laughs> it's an opportunity for that. Uh, I, I wouldn't know, Prof. Uh, Imran Salim, how many minutes more you have? Perhaps we can go for some Q&A in case there is something from you or you would like to share some of uh, your, your concern for time. 
Can't hear you. Can't hear you. Uh, I strongly feel that the discussion is so lively that I hope and wish that it really goes on. But of course, we have limitations. Uh, we still have time. Uh, I think almost uh, we have enough time. But uh, see, my uh, uh, Franco, you have very, very correctly pointed out that there are specific industries through which each of the countries might be benefited. But my point is that barring a few industries and the uh, economies, largely the overall recessionary situation is almost inevitable across the world. And therefore, the, the trade relations and the cross-border relations where I think the most of the island countries heavily depend upon is a major concern and how, how uh, Malaysia is targeting to address that issue, the cross-border relationship. And, and I mean, is there any focus on this or is there some focus on uh, small scale industry, small and medium enterprises, something of that kind? Madam, would you elaborate a little uh, if you have some, some point in this direction? Yeah, because so, see, see, I think the, the whole world is concerned about the potential res uh, recession and the, I mean, the post-COVID strategies of the, of the nations, which, is, which, which actually we are also targeting to discuss. Yeah, Prof. Rita, please. Yeah, I, I think the way forward would be, I mean, in the universities uh, to teach what they practice and uh, develop a business model based on the current case studies about how the employers are changing their work and their workforce, example, online or um, IR4 uh, before. And we are going towards IR5, which is humanization. So food, agriculture is a must now. There's no two way about it. I mean, we are going back to basics and uh, these are the things that we need to re uh, unlearn, relearn and all that because we have left the, that industry just for the uh, manufacturing sector. So for industrialization. So uh, small business and also they call it as tenured entrepreneurship is created due to forces like this because there's no choice. And they have to think about survival. So I totally agree that it's not only Malaysia, but Malaysia is easier to control because it's on the small scale as compared to India or America or China. But look at China, how they manage to you know, go across territories and provinces. So I think high time that uh, all countries should take uh, their own uh, accountability and responsibility of their nation, of their people, in order to provide the food supply, they can grow, uh, you know, small farms at, at just at the backyard to begin with. You know, do not have to be dependent on the government, and um, and uh, we have to start small. And you see, I, I, to me, I feel that this IoT is just superb. They came in at the right time. People use uh, the internet right now to learn about a lot of things, including how to grow, you know, uh, uh, vegetables and many others. How to do fishing, how to do, just name it. You just ask or you just do go on the search engine. At least you can survive, you know, for a short period, short term, and then think about the long term uh, of economy when the things maybe, uh, get better uh, and actually, you know, coming back. Actually, uh, maybe, bro. Okay, I'll take uh, I, I, thank you. I, I can yeah. see for look forward. Uh, Prof. Imran Salim has been uh, insisting because Southeast Asia, members of the Southeast Asian nations are mostly islands. Saib Malaysia is one of them. East Malaysia, Sabah, Sarawak, yeah. which is island. Indonesia is a full of islands, and of course, the Philippines, etc. So, and look at the Singapore, I tell you, Singapore always say, well, we are the tigers. And now in a situation, they are trading, they have been trading nations. And due to the purchasing power of the strong Singapore dollar, they have been importing from Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia at a cheaper rate and try to control their strong in, uh, currency power. And now they are devastated. I don't know what will happen to Singapore. It's a very small island, but Singapore was one of the, I mean, very, very powerful economy uh, prior to the COVID. What will happen to the post COVID to Singapore? I don't know. Maybe Franco, would you like to comment something on that? Franco, Mr. Franco? Yes, yes, yes. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And 
I think it's worth mentioning, re-emphasizing what Professor Dr. Farida said, that it's back to basics. So I think it's not only back to basics for governments and industries and businesses, but for families as well, uh, individuals. And I think every person needs to ask him or herself, what am I good at? And, uh, and what do I want to do? And, uh, and, this applies, and this applies to, uh, as I said, to uh, businesses, to industries, to governments, countries. So a country like Switzerland is in a similar position as Singapore, where they have no natural resources other than people and, uh, and perhaps ac access to water like Singapore. A country like Singapore needs to ask itself, what are we good at? What are the industries we want to we wanna exploit in the next 20 to 30 years? Where are we going strategically? And of course, I cannot answer that on this uh, in this forum, but I'm sure there's a lot of high-level discussions in Singapore as we speak, ascertaining where are we going to go in the next 20 to 30 years? Will it be finance but, and banking? But, but isn't it the strength of Singapore that they have the educational institutions, one of the top in the world in rankings? So human resource may be the another important strength of the Singapore, that's what they have been using in the past. Absolutely, so, I agree. Yeah, yeah. And that's why, that's why I'm drawing the comparison between Switzerland and Singapore, because of both are, are very small uh, countries. Uh, all they really have is, apart from political strength, is the, financing, uh, the finance and banking sector, undergirded by, of course, the labor. They have very good uh, institutions of higher learning. They have a very highly uh, talented and highly educated workforce. So of course, that in itself is, um, is a strength, but will it be sufficient? Will it be sufficient for a country like Singapore to just have that one industry uh, to, to move forward to? Again, I'm comparing it with Switzerland, and these discussions are, are taking place right now. Okay. What are okay. the main industries? But I, I tell you, Singapore is in a very in a hot soup, because most of those industries which Singapore has been relying upon shipping, financial hub, tourism, and it, all these industries are really in a, big, in, in a big mess now. Yes. So perhaps Singapore has to relook back their model of development and Singapore may not remain what it used to be earlier. Maybe so I mean one, two couple of minutes from you, you'd like to participate on this island economies and then the contribution and future. Just be to the yeah, point. Yes. Yes, bro. We have uh, many islands now uh, working on their self sufficient. Uh, some islands in Asia are not just tourism; they have uh, fishing and and also other things. But uh, in the past, our islands are, are not for for tourism. But just because of the tourism campaign, now they become the target of tourism. But now, since the closed border, so our island can go back uh, to their old function uh, with all the herbs. Uh, the, the work on now we emphasize on the sharing economy and the community empowerment. Uh, people can make uh, a lot of things in their islands. Uh, Indonesia perhaps uh, uh, hundreds of islands, and they have been uh, surviving with their what we call the self sufficient. Uh, I remember, you know, the Cocos Island and Christmas Island uh, in, in the past Indonesia, now uh, part of Australia. Before they became Australia, they used to work to survive by their own. No need tourism, but they can survive with whatever yeah, they have. But they have been surviving only by catching the fish, nothing else, what they can yeah. do. So th those are the self sufficient. We, we have to empower, we have to empower back the community for the self sufficient economy uh, while the borders are still pro closed. Pro 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 uh, perhaps this may be the last round. Just I would like to see that Thailand has branded itself and position as a hub for the health tourism because a lot of people they go for health tourism to thailand which is close to your hometown border how do you think impact of this we have heard about singapore heard about the vietnam heard about malaysia but thailand and indonesia is not touched upon perhaps quickly would you like to give one comment before i pass back to professor ibran salim thailand is one of the good economy in the region please profarida um I, I detest that because right now I think our neighboring country suffers a lot. Mm. Uh, Malaysia would be the next probably uh, incoming medical tourism. We, re we have already introduced that, but uh, the latest, um, I would say, report, you know, the tourists who were here prior to COVID, COVID period, 
they they prefer to be here than you know going back to their country of origin because they they know the steps taken by the government the governors the regulators are doing the the right thing to the people and we and we are under control so medical tourism comes in two forms one would be the scientific form you know like the medical healthcare and all that but the other one, like what Swami mentioned just now, traditional herbs and all that, will also be considered as the future of uh, for Malaysia. So, okay, okay. I so think. Opportunities, right. Okay, thank you, Prof. Farida. Prof. Okay. Khan, Prof. Nawab Khan, would you like to inject anything? Perhaps uh, maybe we are close to ending. I, I will pass back it to Prof. Imran Salim. Yes, you I'll are very, you. very, very uh, silent okay. observer. Yes, go ahead. After I listen to you, uh, one thing is impelling me. If you allow me, let me share with you. Go ahead. You know, go ahead. Uh, because, you know, uh, we all know that the whole world is having a challenge from this uh, COVID-19. And uh, as you have observed that regarding the environment, I also have a feel. And when I see these changes here, I really, I really feel this is amazing, actually. You see that the outbreak has led to cleansing of air, water in a very unprecedented way. And I think it will, in, it will be no longer runs. I mean, it is going to save a lot of lives, actually, than the deaths it has caused. In India, if you see that the death rate and the survival rate is too different, you see. But I don't know why uh, people are so much apprehensive, why people are so much afraid of it. But I feel that due to worldwide lockdown, thousands of, thousands of deaths that would have otherwise taken place in accidents or in murders that have been saved. In, in fact. And moreover, you see, the respiratory diseases will also be under check these days. It has been uh, taught that man... And stay home. Living at home is more, more important. People should go out only when this is important or urgent. And SSC works. Otherwise, they should just stay home. And you know, this is not bad at all for unhealthy activities to go outside. So what I feel that, of course, whole world is afraid. There is panic everywhere. But I feel I have some kind of silver lining that I can see. That the life these days seems quite congenial. Other things remaining the same. But uh, if I ask this question for you, that why people are so panicked? You see, in uh, India, how many people have died, how many people have saved their lives. And uh, even then, you know, the uh, problem is so acute that when, whenever there is some problem, this entire area is sealed. And I don't find anything good out of it. So just please let me know what is actually the real uh, outcome that is going to take place. Very good. Actually, uh, you are not just silent observer. You are a critical thinker. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think uh, yeah, uh, Salim, you are right. I, uh, I want to add yeah. one thing. You see, this is the month of May. In the May, I was afraid that the May in Ramadan, inshallah, would be posing a lot of difficulties for us. But you see, in the month of Ramadan, in the month of May, we are observing our fast like we are observing in the month of November, December. In fact, actually, I tell you, I, I wanted to to go for that dimension, but because of the interest and common thing for all of us, Mr. Franco is there, Profiler. We are all Muslims here. Otherwise, I thought of opening the chapter for spirituality. And this is actually a very important area and opportunity for all of us to improve spiritually ourselves. Because other days we are so preoccupied with the humdrum of the daily life. Uh, and we have no time for family. We have no time for even for our creator and God. So there's another opportunity to look at it. But maybe it will turn to be a religious class. I don't want to dwell into that area unless uh, some of you got burning burning point to share uh, <laughs> prof imran salim back to you <laughs> <laughs> imran doesn't let us go outside the track actually uh, 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 responding to my uh, responding to my uh, friend's query that why it is being so alarming it's just the infectious nature of the disease that that is why it is being looked at that way uh, and lockdown is possibly not the solution. It is just a delaying tactics to the infection unless the vaccine is uh, really innovated or some way out are uh, looked after. Prof. But, Ali, uh, I tell you, a lot of things I'm reading. I tell you, these two, three months have been so productive for me academically. Finished two, three papers, almost finishing a book, completing the student's thesis, being at home because... This is sometimes a very productive, but the problem here is that, uh, well, we are not, the whole world is not academic. And uh, in terms of this, the vaccine, etc., there's a lot of conspiracy theory going on. If we open it, it will be the, the, actually the big uh, one of the tin will come out of it. 
lot of conspiracy theories are being talked about. So Actually, yes, by, the problem is the problem is that I mean you rightly said that each one of us is not academician. I'll just share one instance in in my locality, which is said to be the most literate village of the of of the world, where all the doctors and other people uh, reside. And here, two of the suicides have taken place. So yeah, that's that right. is another dimension that we need to really be concerned about. Because you being productive is perfectly all right, but everybody doesn't have that mental strength and and, and the things to do. So. Uh, what I really, uh, as the discussion goes on, I, I really, if I, if I call out the best points that perhaps we have to look back as the economies to our basics. We have to work out with the, with the cottage and small scale industries, uh, which I think was very emphatically uh, insisted by Fajr as well as Fajr. And unless, unless it is the individuals whose confidence is restored in the economic activities, I think nothing substantial would really happen across the world because the governments may come up, the industries and corporates may be activated. Some loans in India recently we have we have uh, exempted, uh, excused for about sixty-eight thousand crores of rupees have been, I mean, uh, pardoned for the industrialists. But those things are not going to really help out the masses. The 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 igniters have to come from the root level, where they can start demanding where actually the propensity to consume is the high is at the top where if we build in that confidence and some supply of money then i think it will prove to be an igniter for the economy for the cascading effect on the aggregate demand of the national economies so this is actually, how i pro, feel pro, and i think pro, pro, yes. prof Sally, this is a, again a, maybe we need to have another seminar and there is one coming forward the money supply in the system itself is a big, big issue now in the banking That's sector. Very true. Because they say this is the fiat money. The real value of the money remains only 2%, 95%, 98% is just paper and digital money on the records. There's so, nothing. And these people are playing the game, according to some people, the World Bank, IMF, <laughs> and other international financing agencies, that they are creating the money from thin air. There's nothing in the reality. So that's a big debate going on. On the other side, that this fiat money and the people who are capitalist bloc, they are taking this opportunity to forfeit the people's uh, real property, real assets, etc., to capitalize upon it. And you see the what happening, the China is taking the lead, buying the big, big assets in the Western and European countries. So I think there's a, perhaps the need for having a, uh, another discussion basically on this uh, banking and... Yes. Maybe you can organize another time, another issue. There are some cases going on. I know I'm part of those groups. Sometimes I listen to them, they're talking. So maybe, actually, yes. Uh, actually, these I, are some, some of the thematic seminars that we are having. And yes. gradually we will move towards more, uh, more focused theme oriented, specific theme oriented. And would, we would love to uh, seek your cooperation and guidance to have more of this kind of uh, webinars in near future. Thank you very much. I think uh, thank you, Dr. Swami, for your time. Thank you to uh, Prof. Farida Hassan for your participation. Mr. Franco, really, we appreciate your presence today for this morning. Sharing. My pleasure. OK, and uh, of course, my thank goes to Chairman Dr. Mohammad Nawab Ali Khan, a good friend, Prof. Imran Salim. But I think both of you are still junior to me. So I have the opportunity <laughs> to, to pull your legs. <laughs> For sure. I always, I always. That is, that is the beauty of Ali fraternity. So, so before we you. close, I, I thank all the uh, panelists on behalf of the Honorable Vice Chancellor of my university who had been, uh, I mean, very supportive to this effort of ours. And I'm particularly thankful to Franco that despite his busy schedule, he had been able to spare some time and share his ideas with uh, us. And I would, uh, I mean, on this very platform, I'm going to request Franco to uh, have another appearance with us. This time, more focused. And, I'd love to. My pleasure. And, and I hope and wish that, that we'll, we, will, we will deliberate uh, more on this once we are together. Uh, I'll keep in touch with all of you. 
and we'll work out certain very specific themes to deliberate further on to these issues so that we can we can generate at least some ideas i i, I think i i have a very strong perception and very positive attitude towards the fact that i strongly feel that even if we can give a good one suggestion to the humanity which contributes is 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 an could be an outcome of all this effort so i i wish and i hope and uh, i really solicit your cooperation into this thank you very much everyone thank you you are welcome okay thank, thank, you. You, thank you very much assalam alaikum okay thank you so much hope to keep in touch thank you and and all well stay home and be healthy thank you Thank, thank, you thank, you so thank you very much thank you very much thank you very much bye everyone nice bye. meeting you all